Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, and welcome to this week's installment of Humane Architecture. Uh, my name is Laura McGuire. I'm your guest host for the week as a part of our Dakomomo Mid-Century Modernism Summer. Um, I am a professor of architecture at the University of Hawaii uh, and an architectural historian. And today, we are going to be discussing the work of Honolulu's own mid-century architect extraordinaire, Alfred Price. Uh, and today, as my guest, I have uh, Timothy Schuler. Uh, Timothy is a local design writer, uh, probably one of the only architecture critics <laughs> in, uh, on the island of Oahu <laughs> at the moment. Um, he, he knows his stuff, and I'm really excited to uh, have a chance to talk with him uh, about Price's work. And what I wanted to do today was actually focus on something that uh, I think some people haven't really noticed that much necessarily about Price, and that is his attention to the roof as an architectural motif uh, and a major feature of his work. Um, so we're going to start off looking at some architectural precedents in roofs and then move directly into looking at some of the really wonderful examples of Price's design, particularly from his residential architecture of the 1950s and early 1960s. So. I'm excited. Yeah, good. So first slide, please. <laughs> so we are not in Hawaii here. Of course, we are at uh, the Forbidden City uh, in China. And the reason I wanted to show this slide was to just talk a little bit really quickly about the importance of the roof as a major design feature in uh, early Chinese architecture, really stretching from the medieval period uh, up into the present in many ways. The roof dominates uh, Chinese architecture and becomes its really primary ornamental uh, and, and design motif. Uh, so we have these really beautiful swooping lines, uh, the gold tile, all of the color uh, on these supports surrounding. So next image, please. Uh, so one of the key features of early Chinese architecture is the use of a system for supporting the roofs called the Dogong bracket system, uh, which basically is a system of interlocking small wooden pieces, uh, almost like Lincoln logs in a way, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that are set together uh, to build a roof up and out. Um, essentially, it's a kind of cantilevered support. So, Next image. And the Dogon bracket system um, really expands throughout uh, early Asia, uh, expands into Japan even. Uh, and in many of these buildings, this is a Buddhist temple, we see the roof taking on this incredibly uh, powerful, rugged kind of form. Uh, now, there's served, served uh, uh, several different um, purposes. Not only was the roof something that sheltered people, uh, but it also, in terms of these broad cantilevered eaves, served to shelter the buildings themselves inside, which were often made from wood or mud brick um, and other materials that are basically biodegradable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we see is a large eave trying to shelter that building inside of it. Uh, but then again, it takes on this uh, very a strong kind of architectural expression for the building as a whole. Next slide. And as you move into Japan, you see all kinds of different iterations of dogong brackets. There's no really one single way to do dogong. The higher and higher you want to build, the more um, articulated these kinds of structures can be. Uh, and those interlocking wooden joints really offer an opportunity uh, for architects to uh, play, 
to have fun uh, with these buildings and to make them really exciting. I think Tim, when you want to, Tim's been looking at um, uh, uh, wooden architecture in, in high rises actually <laughs> recently. Yeah. Um, and I think he knows something a little bit about the, the functional features of this in terms of earthquake resistance yeah. and things well, like that. Well, yeah, as, as we were talking earlier, yeah. These so much of these uh, these wooden buildings that have lasted centuries have done so in part because the wood, uh, far from being fragile, the the uh, biological qualities of the wood actually allows it to move slightly. The the uh, joint system allows it to move in the case of an earthquake or something mm -hmm. like that, and it actually prolongs the longevity of the building. Yeah. Um, as well as the the wood itself also shrinks slightly, expands slightly with, with moisture, and that also is something that's acknowledged here in the architecture. It, it knows, these builders knew exactly what they were doing with wood. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and that, that actually, uh, I mean, it raises an interesting kind of um, uh, point in that looking at design that's sustainable uh, and is going to last a long time, particularly in the context of natural disasters, is something that these ancient Chinese and Japanese architects were very, very aware of and were building strategies into their buildings uh, from a very early point in time to deal yeah. with these kinds of things. And you know, maybe we have lessons that we could learn <laughs> from, from these things. So, I think so. Yeah, next image. Um, I think one of the quintessential examples of the roof in Asian, architect Asian architecture taking on this very dominant um, practical and yet ornamental form is in the famed Issei Shrine, uh, where we have a relatively small uh, enclosure housing a Shinto shrine, but then this very large dominant roof feature uh, where we have thatch and we have these large cross braces. Um, and in fact, so no one can go into Issei Shrine uh, except for people of the Japanese royal family at the mm -hmm. time uh, and priests. And the only thing that people can see on the perimeter of Issei are these roofs poking up out from behind the walls, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, stating the building's presence in the landscape. Next slide. And then here in Hawaii uh, as well, uh, roofs are pretty important. Uh, it rains a lot. <laughs> um, and in, a, in indigenous Hawaiian architecture, um, which really wasn't uh, particularly uh, complex from a spatial standpoint, uh, it was very complex from the standpoint of roof construction. Uh, where you have series of interlocking wooden members lashed uh, together mm -hmm. with various natural materials in order to support an enclosure. Uh, this is a lanai. We're all familiar with the lanai. These were workspaces, uh, areas where people needed to get things done uh, out of the wind and out of the rain. Mm -hmm. so, next image. And we can actually see in, in some reconstructions of these buildings how in incredibly complex these systems really were. Um, simply the number of pieces of lumber involved uh, needed to support these structures, especially in wind mm -hmm. um, and sea air and those kinds of things that offer an incredible uh, stability within the tropical climates. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, and then also in the uh, traditional Hawaiian Hale, this is a, a reconstruction um, actually right across from my apartment building, <laughs> which is uh, at the uh, Center for Hawaiian Studies, uh, where they've done this really lovely, faithful recreation um, of how these buildings were actually constructed. And you can see the complexity of the systems of lashing uh, throughout the structure. And if you ever go down to this building, and I re recommend that everyone uh, does at some point just to take a look at how all of this is put together, one of the things that really comes to the fore, at least in my mind, is those connections of the members, the way that they're tied together. It's a functional building, but these take on a kind of aesthetic feature. I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I mean, I think. Something that's fascinating here is something I think you said too, which is that the roof 
really the roof becomes the entire structure here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think illustrates kind of a lot of what we're talking about. I was also going to add that the Center for Hawaiian Studies itself has some amazing it dramatic does. roofs. So if you want to go, <laughs> if you want to go to Dole Street and check that out, it's, yeah. a, it's an amazing uh, place just to walk around and kind of understand this kind of connection between modern architecture in Hawaii and the way that they tried to kind of take that as inspiration in a very like literal way, but to uh, kind of explore that vernacular. Um, yeah. And the roofs are by far the dominant feature of the, that. Center. I completely agree, and I, I think it's really one of the better examples, uh, at least on Oahu, of taking inspiration from indigenous forms and transforming them, as you said, into a piece of modern architecture. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. But like Ise Shrine or some of these other buildings that we've just talked about, um, those roofs are what you see when mm -hmm. you walk by on, on the street. So. Yeah. Uh, the roof's central importance to the indigenous architecture of Hawaii um, really, I think, can't be overstated. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, next slide. Now, mid-century modernists on the mainland and elsewhere were not unconcerned with roofs. Um, this is Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House, of course, I think many people are familiar with. And in this uh, iconic example of mid-century modernism, Mies also makes a roof line a dominant feature with this white, planar form, uh, particularly creating an indoor-outdoor living space mm -hmm. on that porch. We have this very uh, intense cantilevered projection. But what we don't necessarily see is anything having to do necessarily with height here. The roof itself simply becomes a flat plane. Uh, very much like all the rest of the flat planes in the building. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uh, becoming a dominant feature. Yeah in and of itself. No, it's yeah. not the thing people remark about, yeah. <laughs> remark on, on in this project at all. You don't go to the Farnsworth right. house and say, oh, man, look at that roof. Right. <laughs> so next slide. Now, there are some mid-century modernists, though, that did really begin, I think, to begin to play with um, the different ways that roofs and ceilings could be articulated in buildings. And one of these was Richard Neutra, um, who in his regional California designs was very interested in integrating architecture with the landscape. Uh, and I think that the ways that he creates all of these different levels and interiors um, is an effort to, to echo the cliffs of California. Now, this is a house that's sitting on a cliff. Uh, we see these kinds of stepped features in the ceiling um, that echo this different levels in, in the landscape uh, as well. Next slide. Now, um, getting to Alfred Price, what I think is something that makes Alfred Price really a fascinating architect is the extent to which he incorporates the roof as one of the most critical motifs in his mid-century designs. Now, this is really interesting because Price was not an architect from Hawaii. Right. Uh, Price was an architect from Vienna, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where um, at least in the 1930s, among, uh, among the modernists, uh, those flat roofs with not much articulation were, were all the rage. Uh, but Price moves here in 1939 uh, as a refugee fleeing the Nazis. And I think he really begins to pay attention mm -hmm. to some of the indigenous traditions in the environment, as well as traditions stemming from Asia and mm -hmm. Japan. Yeah, and which were popular. He, Japanese architecture was popular already in Vienna exactly. at the time, so he would have been familiar with it from both sides from of both the world. From both sides, yeah. yeah, exactly. Primarily an interior design, not yeah. necessarily an exterior. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so he's, he's very aware of those influences. But when he comes to Hawaii in 39, he's confronted with an entirely different landscape yeah. <laughs> than he's, and climate, yeah. and climate yeah. than he's used to in Central Europe. Um, and at least I think that he maybe begins to explore the idea of the roof, the idea of the ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, and their importance in architecture that's already here, um, and to inject it into modernism mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in a really innovative way. Yeah. The zoo is a perfect example of that, I think, in that you can see the influences of uh, Hawaii's architecture 
dating back centuries, but yeah. also it's clearly completely different. He's not trying to copy anything. The forms are completely different. The slopes and the angles and the lines that he's playing with are modern, but not something you would ever do in some place like California or Illinois. Yeah, yeah. It's he's a. Uh... He's essentially um, made the traditional Hawaiian hale roof, uh, he's abstracted it, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, made it a little strange. Mm -hmm. This uh, V in mm -hmm. the bottom, mm -hmm. rather than the, the building itself just being straight, yep. a straight ridge line at the top. So, next image. And Price's ceilings themselves are also a really exciting uh, arena in which he explores the possibilities of architectural space. This is the Methodist Church downtown here in, in Honolulu, where we see this vivid use of rafters uh, and wooden joinery uh, to make what is basically a big rectangular box into something really remarkable and, and really special. Mm -hmm. Next image. So in many of his residential designs, uh, the roof continues to be uh, a dominant form for him, uh, with cantilevering eaves, probably drawn from Asian sources, also drawn, of course, I think, from the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. uh, who, Tim, you're very familiar with <laughs> Chicago architecture, yes. and, yeah. Yeah. and I'm sure that you've seen uh, these these kinds of things in, in Wright's houses as well. Definitely. Yeah. But one thing that uh, I think is will become even more clear as we go through some of these residential projects, and we should say quickly that yeah. Price is most well known probably for the Arizona Memorial, yes. um, which we're not talking about here, but yeah. that's going to be the signature <laughs> project that everyone knows. But yeah. here, focusing on his houses and um, these residences, residences all over Oahu, um, one of the things that struck me was just how much fun he had detailing these um, these houses um, and all of the use of color already. We're going to see tons more color, but tons already color. here you can yeah. see that um, you know this bright red ceiling um, under the eave is just not something that you really see that often here. No, no. Even in great mid-century modern architecture. Yeah, so. yeah, it's true. It's true. He's not really trying to blend that into the landscape. No, it, it, it's <laughs> popping it out. Yeah, it's again that statement that he's yeah. making there in the ceiling. It's great. Yeah. Uh, next image. And just uh, to get underneath those eaves, mm -hmm. um, we get a sense of, again, that, that kind of play of color. Uh, and making what is essentially a utilitarian form in architecture, the thing that keeps the rain out, mm -hmm. um, into uh, an ornamental device, very much in keeping with uh, Chinese and Japanese kinds of traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next slide. Um, Another thing that I think we'll see uh, in, in the next several images as well uh, is the way that he uses roof and ceilings um, as ways to demarcate space and path. Uh, so out here, we're, we're on a lanai, um, looking down a set of stairs, and through the articulation of that red roof, he's showing us the path. Mm -hmm. You, know, you come here, you know, where do I go? Yeah. It's almost like he's made a hallway mm -hmm. over your head, yeah. overhead, yeah. without the need of enclosing walls. Right. And, and that articulation doesn't happen in the tile floor. It mm -hmm. happens in the roof. It happens really in the roof. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Next slide. And then with these contrasts in ceiling geometries from that red tile to uh, that paneling below and then the... Uh, the rafters hanging down with the eaves, you get an incredible rich kind of spatial complexity as you take different views throughout the house. Mm -hmm. Next image. Uh, again here, creating complexity through what's above us. Uh, with the color, with the lines. Mm -hmm. We look at the floor, the floor itself is, is basically just flat. Yeah. 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 It's the, <laughs> it's the ceiling that draws your eye outward toward yeah. the view. It's a really, yeah. And it has a sort of curious effect too that even though the ceiling itself is actually kind of low in mm -hmm. these houses in a very Frank Lloyd Wright way, um, the pops of color 
draw your eye up. Yeah. Yeah, so you continue to move up. And this is, um, you know, something that I like to, to talk about with my architecture students is don't just think about floor plans, you know, don't just think about where you're going to put rooms and things like that. Think about how eyes move across space. How can you complicate a space and make it more interesting uh, by looking at things like just the ceiling above us? I don't know what kind of ceiling. Oh, we have <laughs> acoustic tile <Yeah>. up here. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, and even one of our very, well, <laughs> You could go ahead. Well, just the, the carport. Yeah. Um, it's the, the most utilitarian space. But again, you see this heavy, even though he's, not, he's using color in the posts, um, and even though the rest is just wood, it's still very dramatic. It's still a really dominant feature with those rafters going across, mm -hmm. um, breaking up the space. Yeah. Next image. So one of the things that Price uh, does, I think, in the vein of someone like Richard Neutra, particularly on the houses that he has sited on hills, um, this particular house, I believe, is up on Mele Mele uh, Place, up uh, above Manoa, mm -hmm. is to use these very heavy roof lines as a way to articulate the, um, the hillside itself, uh, moving upwards, almost mm -hmm. building out from the hill. Next slide. Uh, and again, using color, contrast, uh, a certain degree of heaviness here, which really contrasts with the lightness of the view mm -hmm. outside. Next slide. And even in his much less expensive houses, Price pays very close attention to the roof. He says, hey, there's a corner. Well, it's cantilever, it's wood. I need to support it. I have to have some brackets there. But how can I do that in, uh, in an interesting and, and exciting way of these really strong angular projections? Next slide. And then the joinery, mm -hmm. uh, the joinery itself. I don't know, is there something about this, um, Tim, that reminds you a little bit of the, the Asian architecture that we looked at briefly at the beginning of the show? Well, for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's obviously completely different, but um, yeah, I mean, looking at it, you can see that this is not, it, you know, the average person is going to walk right under this and not give it a second thought, but this is complex and <laughs> hard to do. Yeah. And um, I think that, yeah, those joints are... Um, really fascinating once you start to look at them. And I think later, too, we'll see some really fascinating connections between um, posts and beams yeah. and columns, and it's, it's fascinating. And he draws attention to it, too, mm -hmm. uh, which I think you see here. Yeah. He's kind of celebrating it. And we don't have a ton of time left, so I actually am thinking the best thing to do is just to go through the rest of these images quickly so the audience can uh, just see a few examples of all of the different things that roofs can do yeah. in a house. So next image. So here, all of those intersections of geometries which parallel there with the floor. Next image. I love this one. Mm -hmm. He's playing with uh, very natural, uh, unfinished wood as a support uh, for that intersection of beams there in the ceiling. Right. Yeah. Next image. Again, these intersecting geometries. Also here, just using that uh, rugged kind of uh, staining for color, not mm -hmm. even necessarily paint, yep. uh, but drawing your eye upward as much as it's drawn outward. Next image. And one of the things that Price does so well, too, is he, he brings the ceiling outside. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, creating, creating almost an interior space outdoors, um, and, but not just leaving it as, a, as kind of a, you know, a leftover space or an afterthought. It's yeah. like very intentionally detailed here, the way that ceiling continues down this um, outdoor courtyard or walkway, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But yeah, yeah, it feels interior. It does. Next image. And this is a perfect example. I mean, he's essentially created a kind of garden pergola, uh, uh, inside, outside. Is it inside? Is it outside? I mean, that's one of the, the wonderful things about uh, regional Hawaiian modernism is this blurring of those boundaries between in and out. So next image. 
And this is where Price really, I think, begins to have a lot of fun yes. um, in many of his ceilings, is just playing with cutouts. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, okay, it's a white room, it's rectangular, somewhat nondescript, so what does he do? He just takes a slice yeah. Yeah. <laughs> out of it, which draws your attention to that corner and at the same time makes the room look bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And next slide, this is another great one, too. Mm -hmm. You know, cut out another portion of the ceiling uh, in order to differentiate different areas of the room. Next slide. Or paint your ceiling blue <laughs> and paint a supporting beam white. Yeah. <laughs> Just so many opportunities for really, I think, joy mm -hmm. uh, in his ceiling and roof designs. Next slide. And here, this is, you know, I think really taking a, a, a page from the book of Frank Lloyd Wright um, in terms of highlighting, or even the arts and crafts architects, green and green, uh, highlighting wooden joinery um, in really complex ways. Yeah, geometrically, we have these verticals, uh, we have these kind of waffle shape patterns, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And this is one of the. Oh. We'll probably just end with this building. Yeah, we it's should. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so amazing. I love this one so much. Yeah, one of one of the the greatest examples I think of Price's interest in the roof, where he drops the ceiling down in different levels. There's an area of, of um, rafters above it, but then um, we we have this lower section uh, with wood uh, finished in a really beautiful way. Mm -hmm. That looks like hung from those hung. rafters, even though those yeah. rafters are supporting the next ceiling. And then there's even the ceiling above that. This uh -huh. roof is completely yeah. Uh, yeah. split. The next image will show that if we want to get to the next one, too. So mm -hmm. there, you know, you have this kind of lower roof, middle roof, <laughs> <laughs> upper roof and yeah. then upper roof. Yeah. Next image. Uh, there's something really similar going on in, in this house as well mm -hmm. uh, with the layering of roofs. And the floor is flat, yeah. though. Uh, so really, all of the visual interest mm -hmm. comes from what's above us. And this totally illustrates what you were saying earlier about the ceiling also demarcates space. And it yeah. draws you through. It guides you into one space yeah. um, and into the next. Next image. So this is one of the last two images that we'll show, but um, here we can see all of those amazing intersections of lines in his ceilings. It's an incredibly deep uh, space uh, above us. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next image. And this is just a symphony. <laughs> yeah. A symphony of ceiling lines <laughs> uh, brought together with this wonderful intersection uh, with the walls as well. So I don't know. I mean, I, I just think that um, this is really one of the key things that uh, people need to understand when they look at Alfred Price's work, uh, that the man is a master of the roof. Uh, the man is a master of the ceiling. Um, and that's a, hoping that something I'm hoping to be able to talk about more. Mm -hmm. um, and you are literally I, writing a book I'm on Price, right? <laughs> I'm literally <laughs> writing a book on Price uh, with my co-authors, uh, Jack Gilmar and um, Don Hibbert, who has often been a guest on this show. Uh, as well. So um, thank you, Tim. I, I think I talked the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you should, as you should. No, I'm just happy to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Oh, well, it's a it was a delight to discuss all of this with you beforehand, too. So Beautiful work. I'm yeah, excited to share it with the rest of the world. Lots of fun pictures. <laughs> so great. Well, who's on next week? I don't even know, but more mid-century modern, right? More mid-century <laughs> modernism from uh, from the various board members at Dakamoma. So we will be looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I will definitely be tuning in. Um, and who knows? More of Alfred Price's work may come up in in the lineup, or some Vladimir Osipov, or something else would be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And Tim, you're actually working on an article on Alfred Price, yeah. too. Yes, aren't you? it'll be out this I almost this, forgot about that. Out this, yeah, it'll be out this fall. Um, we'll, you know, we can let people know where to, where to get it. But um, yeah, maybe I'll be back on Martin's show talking about it more. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, thank you all for joining us for this week's edition of Humane Architecture. Thank you.